So Derek's not here today, so I get to talk this morning. And last week, we spoke about the importance of being generous with our resources. And this week, we're going to talk about being generous with our opportunities. And for a lot of us, being generous isn't something that necessarily comes naturally to us. And sometimes it's easier in one area than, other, than the other. So next week, Derek will be talking about being generous with our time which is not really an area that I've ever struggled with, but the one that I did was the one that he talked about last week, which is about money. So our human nature only wants us to worry about ourselves and making sure that we and our people, our family, are taken care of. And that was a lesson that Derek and I really had to learn as we grew in our faith. When we were first married, we were pretty young, money was tight, and we were both in college, and we were both working part-time jobs. And we determined that even though we knew tithing was really important, we couldn't tithe. We didn't have money for that. We had no resources. And we just kind of were struggling along. We didn't know if we were going to be able to pay our bills. Um, we barely were making it. But at some point, several years later, we both really felt convicted about our unfaithfulness with our finances. So we started to tithe. And... I'm sure this is not surprising to most of you. God took care of us. There have been times where it's been tight and we've been tempted to skip our tithe in order to make things more comfortable, but we don't because we've seen how God has always carried us through. We've never gone without, and I'm really not sure how it works other than that God is God. And so that really helped us to be able to trust in other areas of life, whether it's big things or small things. So this week, we're going to talk about being faithful with our opportunities. Um, all throughout Scripture, we see God calling his people to be faithful in what they're called to do. Starting with Adam, he was set to name the animals, and he had to take care of the garden. And Jonah, being called to Nineveh, even though he didn't do it joyfully, he was still called there, and he still was supposed to do that. And Paul, who left his home and headed out to share Jesus with those who hadn't heard. And today our scripture comes from Matthew 25. We're going to do verses 14 through 28. Um, this is a parable of Jesus. It's called the parable of the talents. It's also referred to sometimes as the parable of the coins or the parable of the bags of gold. In this section of scripture, Jesus is talking to his followers about what they're going to be do, so what they're going to do after he's gone, and how they're going to be able to prepare for his return. And he tells the parable about a master who's going on a journey and leaves his servants in charge of his money. Four, so this is from the, I believe the CEB version. I can't exactly remember. I looked at so many versions. Um, this is verse 14 15. For it's just like a man to go on a journey. He called his own servants and entrusted his possessions to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, depending on each one's ability. And then he went on a journey. So he gives different amounts to different servants. He gives one the five talents, and one the two, and one the one. It doesn't really tell us why, other than that it was due to the servant's abilities. So my thought is maybe the guy who got five had proved himself before. Maybe he was like, yeah, I, this guy can do this. Maybe he just had the most experience. Maybe the work, master had worked with him before, and he just liked him the best doesn't really tell us. We don't know. But we do know that the master seemed to understand what he could entrust him with. He gave opportunities that were appropriate for each person. But on a side note, before you feel too sorry for that last servant with his one talent, understand that the amount he was given was not a small amount. It was the equivalent of about 20 years worth of income. So even though he felt like he maybe felt like he didn't get as much as everybody else. He still had a ton. Um, when we go into verses 16 and 17, it says, Immediately, the man who received five talents went, and he put them to work, and he earned five more. In the same way, the man with two talents earned two more. But the man who had received one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. So the three servants were entrusted with the master's resources. He left. 
and he left them to do what they would with his money. The story doesn't really indicate that they were supposed to do anything specific. He doesn't tell them, yes, go bury it in the ground. Yes, go make sure you make me some more money. He didn't tell them what to do, at least not as far as our story is concerned. But due to their knowledge of the master, the first two servants used what they were given, and they doubled it. After a long time, the master of those servants came back and settled their accounts with him. The man who had received the five talents approached, presented the five more talents, and said, Master, you gave me five talents, and I've earned you five more. The master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful over a few things, and I will put you in charge of many things, sharing your master's joy. The man who had two talents also approached. He said, Master, you gave me two talents. See, I've earned two more. And his master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Share your master's joy. Both the two and the five-talent servant received the same exact praise from the master. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many. Come and share your master's happiness. It wasn't about the amount that they had earned. The five-talent servant didn't get more than the two-talent servant as far as praise and what he was going to then be in charge of. He was The master was pleased with both of them. But then we go on to this one-talent guy. And he said, it says, The man approached, <coughs> excuse me, The man who had received the one-talent approached and said, Master, I know you. You're a harsh man, reaping where you haven't sown and gathering where you haven't set, scattered seed. So I was afraid, and I went off, and I hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is yours. His master replied, You evil, lazy servant. If you knew that I reap where I haven't sown and gathered where I haven't scattered, then you would have deposited my money with the bankers, and I would have received my money back with interest when I returned. So take that talent from him and give it to the one who has ten. So we see a different outcome for this one talent man. For an outside perspective, it doesn't really seem like he's done anything wrong. He didn't lose the talent. He didn't spend it or gamble it away. He didn't give back less than what he had been entrusted with. He returned what the master had initially given him. But as we can tell from our scripture, the master was less than pleased, taking what the servant had and passing it on to the first servant, who had been faithful with what he was given. In the same way, that the master gives talents to his servants, God has provided us with certain giftings and opportunities. Some people seem to have a ton, just like the first servant with his five talents. Others of us maybe don't feel like we have as many. Maybe we only have two or one talent to work with. But that doesn't make our opportunities less important than the person who has more. We can't compare what we're given to what others are given. Corinthians... Hold on. There are different gifts that come from God. In Corinthians 12, 1 Corinthians 12 says that the same Spirit distributes them. All giftings are a blessing from God. We need to make the most of what God has given us. Each gift, every opportunity, is from God. But we have to decide what we're going to do with them. The opportunities that God gives us are unique. Each person is given something different. We can't compare what we're given to what others have been given. We need to make the most of what God has given us. And in God's eyes, it isn't about how much we bring back to him, but it's about what we do with what he's given us. Remember, the five-talent servant and the two-talent servant receive the exact same praise. You have been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many. The five-talent servant didn't get more than the two-talent servant. The master was very pleased with both of them. It doesn't benefit our faithfulness to compare our giftings with the giftings of others. God has given us our giftings for a reason. William Barclay says in his commentary on Matthew, it's not a man's talent which matters. What matters is how he uses it. God never demands from a man abilities which he has not got. He does demand from a man that he should use his full abilities for what he does possess. Men are not talent, equal in talent, but men can be equal in effort. The parable tells us that whatever talent we have, great or little, we must lay it at the service of God. 
or, as it says in 1 Peter 4.10, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in various forms. Faithful stewardship of the gifts that God gives us is a way we can praise him. So all three of the servants were entrusted with something different. They each had an opportunity to make their master proud. Two of them did that, but one of them just dashed his talent away. We don't really know why the one-talent man did this. Maybe he hid the money because he thought it wasn't really that important. He didn't have as many talents as his fellow servants, so why do you even worry about it? He had been... He, was, he should have worried about it because he was entrusted as a steward of his master. Warren Wearsby says, Were it not for the one-talent people in the world, very little would get accomplished. His one talent could have increased it too and brought glory to his master. Sometimes we feel like what we have to contribute is not that important. We tell ourselves, I'm not the Sunday school teacher or the pastor, or I'm too young, or I'm too old, and God can't use me. We have opportunities, but we tend to push them aside because we don't think we can do it or we don't think it'll make a difference. But we are each important to the functioning of the family of God. So sneak peek, Pastor Derek is working through 1 Corinthians, and I'm going to give you a little hint about what's coming up in a couple weeks. Well, whenever he gets back to the sermon series. 1 Corinthians 12 says, Now if a foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would, not reason to be, it would not be for that reason to, that it would stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I don't belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God placed the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts but one body. So I felt, I felt affected by this. As many of you guys know, I recently had a really bad hip issue, and it was just not okay. I could barely walk. Um, for several days, Derek had to help me stand up, or uh, if I was sitting, I couldn't stand up. If I was laying, I couldn't sit up. Um, I was in so much pain, I think more pain than I've ever been in in my life, and I've delivered three babies. Um, it was awful. My body was not working right. And it wasn't working right because one part decided to act up. It messed with the whole way my body functioned. Because I couldn't do the things I normally do, it affected our entire family. My hip issue affected my whole body. We don't really know what was going on with my hip, but it doesn't really matter. It wasn't working. And this is what happens when one of the people of God decides not to do what God calls them to. If they don't do what they're supposed to, it impacts the entire church and opportunities are missed or they get passed on to someone else. So, in our lives, let's talk about the one-talent servant first. The servant knows what his master is about. He says right there, I know this is the kind of person you are. But even so, he didn't put that into practice. And in turn, he was shamed for the way that he handled the talent that he was given And it was taken away from him to be given to a servant who had been responsible. He was no longer trusted to do what would benefit the master. When we don't understand who God is, if we don't have an intimate relationship with him, we can't use the gifts he's given us to grow his kingdom. Our gifts are given to us by God so that we can reach others and make a difference. If we don't use them for that, they are wasted, and those opportunities should be given to somebody else. Now, on to the other servant. They were praised for the way they used what they were given. They knew what kind of what the master would want from them. The parallel for us is that a strong connection with God will help us to know what he expects us to do and how to use what we've been given. And like the five talent servant, the more opportunities we take to be generous, the more opportunities God gives us. Our relationship with God and our redemption through Jesus should make us want to be generous with the gifts he's given, whether it's our talents or our finances or our time. If we're reluctant to be generous, we need to spend some time renewing our relationship with Christ. Christ generously gave himself for us, and we can never repay what he's done. But we can bless others with what God has given us, showing Jesus 
along the way. We're going to finish with a song, and then I'm going to pray. If there's anything that you want to talk to God about, now's a good time. You can talk to him where you're at, or if you want to come up to the altars, that's always a good place if you want to lay something at his feet. Just today, I heard a story of a pastor far away who watched his church walls fall with the rain. With tears in his eyes, here's what he had to say. Let's reach the ones that were about this place. I want to know you like that, to live, to love with everything I am, to give. David did He lived a life this world cannot forget He fought so hard and get back up again Then face that giant knowing he will Because you were with him Wanna know you like that To live, to love With everything I am To give it all I wanna know I wanna know you like that To live, to love With everything I am To give it all I wanna know you like that To become a man after your heart And not look back I wanna know you like that To live, to love With everything I am I'll give it all I want to know you like that Lord, to become A man after your heart And I look back I want to know you like that I want to know 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 God, I thank you for the gifts that you've given us. I thank you that you provide us all with a little bit something different so that we can reach different people and have different opportunities. But I pray that we continue to look to you to see the generosity and the gifts that you give us and that we can use those to reach out. Help us to remember where we were at before we had you and help us to use what you've given us to reach the others who don't know about how much you love us. Lord, I thank you for this time that we've been together this morning. I thank you for blessing us. I thank you for loving us. I thank you for taking care of us. Help us to have a good rest of the afternoon and help us to use our resources and our time and our giftings to bless others this week. In Jesus' name, amen.